today is Mother's Day, and we want to acknowledge all the women we're blessed to know. We rejoice over you for your strength, your wisdom, your strong love, and your beautiful faith. Whether today is a celebration for you or a day of quiet reflection and healing, we're thinking of all of you. If you gave birth this year to your first child, our joy overflows and we celebrate with you. If you adopted a child this year or became a foster parent, we rejoice with you and we want to honor you in your commitment to changing the lives of children. If you continue to struggle with infertility, we are hoping with you and holding your hand in prayer. If you are exhausted and feeling underappreciated for all you do for a house full of kids, we applaud you. We love you and we appreciate you more than you can ever imagine. And if you lost a child this year to death or miscarriage, we weep and mourn with you. And if your child is lost to addiction or to the world, we hurt with you and we join you in putting our hope in the one who brings prodigals home. If you live with painful memories of your mom, we pray that you will find in a spiritual mother all that you never had from a birth mom. And if you're one of those amazing spiritual moms, we thank you for stepping up and being there when others couldn't. If you're experiencing an empty nest for the first time this year, we walk with you in this new season and are excited about the next chapter God has planned for you. If you're single, we celebrate your strength, beauty, and individuality and join with you in praying for the desires of your heart. If you're a single mom and wonder if you have the physical energy and financial resources to raise and provide for your child or children, we want to help you, and we will. And if you're pregnant for the first time, we prayerfully anticipate with you the joyful birth of a healthy child. And to all the special women on this Mother's Day, rest and delight in knowing that we are thankful for you and we celebrate each and every one of you. Good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. It's, uh, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. It's especially good to be in the house of the Lord on Mother's Day where we celebrate our mothers. Uh, that's all right. Go ahead. I, I am so thankful for, uh, for my mo mother and uh, the, the challenges that she faced raising the three of us, me and my two sisters. Uh, they were bad. They really were. <laughs> So uh, just a couple things we want to get out of the way before we get started here. We want you to feel as safe as, uh, as you need to be. So if uh, you want to wear a mask, please feel free. Don't, don't uh, feel, uh, I mean, we want you to be safe. So wear a mask. Uh, I'm wearing a little sticker here that says hugs are okay. We have other stickers that says keep your distance. So uh, please put one of those on. Feel safe. Be comfortable in the house of the Lord because... Uh, we're here to worship him, right? Um, another thing that we want to do is uh, we want to bear one another's burdens. And the way we do that is we fill out prayer requests. And when we have our corporate cry out, we, we can help bear your needs. We can help uh, know what's troubling you and we can help you pray about it. So please uh, fill one of these requests out or in the back there if you have something that you want to share with uh, your brothers and sisters. So last thing on the on the table here is being connected. So uh, please click through and read the bulletin. There's a, a wonderful uh, pastor's corner this morning from Pastor Sander about mothers. So please take the time, click through, read that. It, it will bless your heart. I'm sure it would do it. It blessed mine. So please stay connected with everything going on in the church. We want you to be prepared for everything that, that we're going to do. So... Now that I've said that and we got everything out of the way, let's go into worship. So would you stand with me? And 
I welcomed you into the house of the Lord. Let's welcome the presence of the Lord into his house. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day and for your blessings. God, I ask that you meet with us here today. Father God, you know our hearts. Some are heavy, some are lifted up. God, meet with us and fulfill our needs. Help us, Father God, to, be, to uh, offer worship that's pleasing to you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let's sing the only name that's worth singing of, Jesus. Amen. You are good. You are good. When there's nothing good in me, you are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. Thank you, Lord.
All right. And I didn't touch anything, so maybe I should just stand still and not move. <laughs> and you know, sometimes wires make a big difference. This morning, if, if maybe you're here for the first time, we utilize this time. We call it corporate cry out. And why is it important? Because James tells us in James chapter 5 that the effectual fervent prayer, verse 16, of the righteous avails much. And I have no doubt in my mind that there are needs all over this room this morning. How many of you, there's a need? You didn't put it on a piece of paper, but it's on the inside, right? Why is that hand important? Because when you raise your hand, guess what? Your heart screams to God. He hears the need. But specifically today, we want to lift up uh, Lorna Pretty and the, their family diagnosed with cancer. How many of you know when you hear those words, it just a lot of times strikes terror in our hearts, but our God is bigger. I said our God is bigger, yes. and he is able to still do far above we could ever understand. We want to be lifting Juanita got an ear infection that God would touch her. Pastor, why do you take time to call these things out? Because it's important. And if it were your needs written on a page, you would want someone praying for you as though it were their, your life standing in the balance as well. So these are important. Um, how many of you this morning uh, have uh, what we call these personal unspokens that maybe that wasn't a part of what your hand was on the first, but it's those things that are in your life or family and you say, those are there too. Just kind of go like this. Yeah, yeah. He knows those things too. And then, if you're struggling this morning, there's a need on the, on the page here. If you're struggling on, on career or, or where a career is going or decision-making on that, or if maybe you got some family members that are challenging, maybe you deal with the plethora of stuff in your heart, God is able to help you with all those things. And then we want to lift up also Sally Evans, that God will touch her and, and bring to her healing and the miracles that only God is capable of doing. And this morning, as we lift our voice and pray, we're going to call these needs before the Lord and even the ones that are in your heart. And on the heels of it, we're going to return into a time of worship. Why? To give God continual thanks because he always hears, he always sees, he always responds, he's always moving. Father, thank you for the privilege that we have to look to you today. And there's a variety of needs that we have. There are needs that we talk about. There are needs that we don't talk about. There are needs that we write down. There are even needs that we post all over the place. But regardless if they're posted or if they're private, we thank you that you're a God that's more than enough, that you are able to reach down for these needs today that we've lifted that need healing. We thank you, Lord, that you're able to heal back issues, sciatic issues, cancer issues, ear infection issues, and all the other things that have impact our body. You were striped for our healing, and we're grateful for that. For those that need peace today, we're grateful that you're able to give them peace that surpasses their own human understanding. We're grateful, Lord, that you're able to give direction in career. You're able to touch our hearts in dealing with oftentimes the areas that come in for unforgiveness and all that stuff that floods us on a daily basis. And today... We are grateful and we thank you for all of our moms and the influences, whether they're physical or spiritual moms. We're grateful today. So would you touch your people today? And as we lift our eyes to the hills from where our help comes from, maybe for some it's a little bit of a strain. But as we do it today, be glorified as we look to you, knowing that our help indeed always has come from the Lord, the maker, ruler of it all. And today we give you praise, honor, and glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord, because you always hear, you always see, and you always answer according Amen. to your great plan. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Continue to lift your voice and worship to the Lord as he's worthy. Say this with me. My God is greater. You ready? My God is greater. Amen. He took care of it all. Yes, he did. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine
God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, he's awesome in power. Our God, our God. Yes, amen. Y'all sound beautiful this morning. We serve a faithful God, right? He always keeps his promises. When the weight of life begins to fall On the name of Jesus I will call
Sometimes that's hard to do. It is hard to do. Doesn't matter what I feel or what I see. That's the reality of it. But the difficulty is, is for many people, it does matter what they feel and see because we make decisions on all the things that manipulate our thought patterns and behaviors. And all that we are and all that we ha have in our lives and hold dear must be in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hell, he knows it's difficult. The Bible says that Jesus overcame all the world so that you and I would be able to have this peace. So, Lord, thank you for your peace today. That it doesn't matter what we feel or see, although it's the reality in our lives daily. We're inundated with media and all kinds of things. But your word must be the steadfast and the constant of our lives. And so today, let that resonate in our lives, our heart and our mind, not to live based on what we see, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And to live by your word and let your peace surround us and fill us and guide us into all things. And for what you do and the joy you give, we'll be grateful to you, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you today for who you are. And we thank you that as we today celebrate our moms, we celebrate, Lord, the reflection that they have of you in all that they provide for so many in their lives. We bless you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Would you give the Lord a praise one more time? He's worthy. Amen. And you may be seated this morning. I know that there are a lot of things on everybody's agendas. Hopefully one of your agendas is not to go to a restaurant later because I am hearing that it will be lots of lines throughout the different restaurants. But uh, we are delighted that you're here today. And once again, to all of our, our ladies, happy Mother's Day. And one of the things that that video that we shared at the beginning showed is it doesn't matter if you've given physical birth or not, everybody has the ability to be a mom and to provide nurturing and love and uh, so much more. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but our moms have great value. Wasn't able to share this in the first service. Our time constraints sometimes. You guys get the full brunt in the second service, but first service sometimes has to be trimmed a little bit with all the different things. But have you ever thought about what a mom is worth? <clears throat> have you ever thought about it from an annual salary standpoint. I know some of you ladies, when I share this with you, you're going to be like, hallelujah, bring it to me or something. But so here, here's the hats that moms will wear. You are an academic advisor. You're an accountant, number one. You're the art director, the athletic director. You're the purchaser, the buyer, the CEO, the coach, the daycare teacher, the dietitian, the instructor, the event planner, the executive uh, housekeeper at times. You're the facilities director. You direct the grounds. You're the interior designer. You're the, at times, the judge and the magistrate. At times, you are the logistics manager, the supervisor of all networks. You're the photographer, sometimes the plumber, sometimes a public school teacher, and sometimes a psychologist, sometimes a recreational therapist. <clears throat> sometimes you're the staff nurse, sometimes the tailor, and sometimes the life manager. <clears throat> In case you're wondering, here's what that equates to on a value, and this is coming from actuarial studies that were done. A mother's worth today is worth a salary of $204,201 a year. <clears throat> My Lord, I figured some of y'all would be like, well, that's what I'm talking about. But you looked at me like a donkey at a new gate. So $204,201. Y'all like, well, that's that, praise God. Praise God. I got to be dignified in the house. <laughs> hey, you have to look. A merry heart does good like a medicine. Here's some of the things that changes over time. When you're four years old, your mommy can do anything. When you're eight years old, your mom knows a lot, a whole lot. When you're 12 years old, mom doesn't know a whole lot of anything. When you're 14 years old, mom absolutely doesn't know anything. When you're 16 years old, your mom is seen through the lens of hopelessly as old-fashioned. When you're 18 years old, that old woman, she's way out of date. When you're 25 years old, well, she may have known a little bit of what she was talking about. When you reach 35 years of age, your mindset is before we do something, let's 
talk to mom. And then as you get older in years, you approach the older years of your own life and your mind goes to things like this. I wonder what mom would think about today. And then finally, the last thought on that is you get to a place at certain ages where you say, I wish I could talk to mom just one more time. Let me just encourage all of you ladies today. Your influence is invaluable. Your reach is unmistakable. And you make a difference in ways that you could never fully comprehend. So please, 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 please make sure that you value each day because you are absolutely treasured. A few things that I want to share with you this morning. Um, I want to first of all thank Christy and Chad and our Kids Planet. They put on the muffins for mom today. Yeah, they did great. If you were able to go back there uh, in between services or come in, uh, they had a wonderful time. If you didn't get able to, weren't able to get back there, they're still going to have a little bit of things set up. So if you'd like to, moms, go back there and, and get a card and a gift and all that kind of stuff, please, ladies, uh, go ahead and do that. They, uh, they've been doing a great job in our kids' church and directing that and trying to uh, get that uh, reworked on the face of coming through all the pandemic stuff. But uh, one of the things that they've done that I so love is they are involving our kids. And let me just say this to you. You never know what's going to happen in kids' church. And so that's why it's important if you want your kids involved to have them there because they do things like what I'm about to show you. And what I'm about to show you is coming from the minds and mouths of your children, those that were, uh, that were there, when they talk about the different elements of, of, of you. And so I've added a song to this video. It's several minutes long. I want you to hear the words of a song by a friend and colleague of mine that was written, coupled with the video of things that your kids have said. Let's take a look at it together and laugh a little bit. <laughs> I gave you heartburn and I made you sick Long before I even took my first breath And you barely slept for two years after you brought me home I ruined your carpet and colored your walls Then did it again after you scrubbed it off And if you were lucky, I'd give you the bathroom alone Still you look back on it all and you smile. Oh, what's the best thing about your aunt? She, she's, she loved her birthday. How old is she? She's 68. What does she do to cheer you up? She let me play the Xbox. What's something she's always telling you? Brush my teeth. Ha Happy Mother's Day. What's the best thing about your mom? She's nice. How old is your mom? I don't know. What's something she does to cheer you up and make you happy? Uh, a lot of things. What's something your mom's always telling you? I don't know. A happy Mother's Day. Right, what's the best thing about your mom? She's good. How old do you think she is? What's something she does to make you happy? What's something your mom's always telling you to do? Stop playing with my sister. Oh, happy Mother's Day. Uh, what's the best thing about your mom? I, I love her and she loves me so much. How old do you think your mom is? 48. What's something she does to make you happy or cheer you up? What's something your mom's always having to tell you? Well, uh, almost everything. Happy Mother's Day. Now, what's the best thing about your mom? That she takes care of me. How old do you think your mommy is? <laughs> what's something she do does to make you happy? She makes me go silly. What's something your mommy's always having to tell you? What's the best thing about your mom? It's my 
favorite is mom, and she has a, has the best mom in the world. How old do you think mommy is? Sixteen. What's something she does to cheer you up? What's something mommy's always having to tell you to do? Roll her Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. And what's the best thing about your mom? Love her. You love her? How old do you think your mommy is? She's five. What's something she does to make you happy? She tickles. What's something mommy's always having to tell you to do? Stand up. Stand up. Happy Mother's Day. All right, what's your favorite thing about your mommy? She runs around with you. How old do you think your mommy is? You don't know? Okay. What's something she does to make you happy? She runs around with you. What's something she's always having to tell you to do? To be still? Can you say happy Mother's Day? Say happy Mother's Day. Hey, what's the best thing about your mom? She cares for me. How old do you think your mom is? About 40 or 41. What's something she does to make you happy? Takes me to fun places. What's something she's always having to tell you to do? Be quiet. Happy Mother's Day. And if you were lucky, I'd give you the bathroom alone. But still you look back on it all and you smile. So here's to your mom from the heart. Thank you for loving me tenderly And showing me how to be strong The least I can do after all you have done Is give you this Mother's Day song For sitting with me when that girl broke my heart And letting me practice with your brand new car for teaching me how to make Jesus my everything For being right there every time that I'd fall And praying for me faithfully through it all I am convinced I'm still here cause you stayed on your knees I don't tell you enough just how special you are I'm grateful now from the depths of my heart I thank you for loving me tenderly And showing me how to be strong The least I can do after all you have done Is give you this Mother's Day song As hard as I try, I can honestly say that we all would be lost without one. So thank you for loving me tenderly and showing me how to be strong. The least I can do after all you have done is give you Mother's Day song. Happy Mother's Day to all of our ladies. Yeah. The words from that song stuck out to me quite uh, strongly, and hopefully uh, they made you think, whatever age you are, of all the wonderful things that um, moms have been over the years in your lives. One of the things that uh, God has enabled us to do as a body is to be able to bring back to this community a thing, a program that we have 
kick back off called Time Out. If you're not familiar with Time Out, it's simply a free service to our community where they get three free hours of child care twice a month. They did that yesterday. Our numbers are continuing to grow, and uh, so we're grateful for that and all the folks that made that uh, possible. And I want to just make one um, commendation. One of the things that we have done in the relaunching of this outreach is created and this is, I wanted to take a moment in the first service, but just, again, time constraints time, sometimes get us, is we have created an area to be able to minister to children with special needs. And Pastor, why is that important? Because it's vitally important. Moms and dads and even the children need safe places. And, and I want to commend uh, Robin and the Time Out folks for creating such space. I know you all have been praying for the parking lot project. Let me give you a quick update. It's not starting tomorrow. <laughs> I know you're like, man, uh, there's been some, some more delays and, and, and things like that that's beyond my control. Uh, the sidewalk work will be getting started tomorrow, but the parking lot now is pushed to the end of the month. Uh, it's now looking like the 24th of May. It's okay. The basketball goals have arrived. Uh, they are safely put away. Uh, all the other things, the bleachers will be delivered this week. Here's the good news. Uh, it is our goal, see that play on words, uh, to hopefully by the first week of June have the community basketball courts open. Uh, the the Wi-Fi will be online by the end of this week, which is our free community Wi-Fi initiative that people can come on the property and get free 200 meg, two to 300 meg uh, internet service. Uh, there's a lot of things that you and I together are a part of that uh, have never been done in our community. So I want you to keep those things in prayer because it's vitally important uh, as we reach people in our community with the goodness of our Lord. One final thing to give to you, of course, Pastor Steve reminded you, play, please pay attention to emails and all that kind of good stuff. And if you don't get those, you can scan one of our QR codes or even register at the uh, registration desk there in the back because uh, a lot of information comes out. On Sunday, May 23rd, that is going to be another important day. You say, why is that? Well, Sunday, May the 23rd, we are going to be having together uh, first two, a two-part thing. Number one, it's going to be a special celebration service. Um, as most many people already know, and we want to make sure we do it from this platform, uh, Bobby Varner uh, is going to be leaving us, and she has taken a full-time position uh, in another church, in another ministry uh, somewhere. And uh, we thank God for her uh, influence and all the wonderful things that she has done and been a part of here at the church. And so we are going to be uh, honoring the Lord and honoring her that day and uh, setting her forth for this next season in her life uh, that God has opened to her. I know many of you have been told on the down low, uh, but we want to make sure that we announce it publicly because how many of you know if you don't do that kind of stuff, it always leaves room for somebody to do this. I know you've never known anybody to do that, but it does happen at times in the church or any organization. And I know that we as a body have been through numerous transitions over the last year and a half uh, or so, but transitions are not bad. And we thank God for all the wonderful things that, that she's been a part of. We want to celebrate that and uh, send, send her into the next season that God has opened for her uh, the right way and, and with blessing and with prayer and all that wonderful stuff. So we wanted you to be aware of it. Yes, uh, there'll be stuff coming out to you this week on kind of what that's going to look like and how you can partner with us uh, for that specific day. That's the first thing. Then following that special time of celebration, we're going to have a brief, brief uh, church annual, uh, not annual, church conference, business conference. We're making it uh, known today because we've got to give legally two, a two-week window of notice. And in that uh, special meeting, there's going to be two things that are going to be primarily the focus. Number one, uh, the church will uh, deal with a nomination for a new treasurer position, number one. And then number two, we'll give you the uh, updates on um, where the total community project stands, the financial breakdown, where that is. Uh, potentially uh, some things looking forward for some other positions not real sure on that yet uh, may not uh, be on that uh, this time around but uh, I want you to keep that in mind okay so everybody take a nice deep breath look at your neighbor and say everything is all right, everything is all 
So we are excited about all the wonderful things that God has uh, in front of us and for all God's people as we follow him. In just a moment, as today is a tradition we started many, many years ago, in just a few moments, my wife, Amanda McCarty, is going to be coming and bringing the word of God to us this morning and sharing with you. And so I want you to give her attention as you would me or anyone else that would stand in this pulpit. But before she comes, there's a small video that she selected that she wants you to take a look at. And on the heels of that, she will come and share the word of God with you today. Would you take a look with us? Praise the Lord for our moms. That's what we're here to celebrate this morning. Um, I appreciate my husband um, giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I was telling somebody earlier, last year this time looked a lot different. There was nobody in the building, and I was preaching to an empty, um, empty crowd. So I'm glad that you're here this morning. I am glad that all of our moms are here this morning, but I'm particularly glad that my mom is with me today and our family. Um, Deborah Jenkins, she's here with me, and... Um, Mom, I thank you for the blessing that you've been in my life, your prayers, and um, that she's a woman of faith and, and, and has helped me um, many times along the way. So um, if you get a chance, go by and say hello to her. She's a, she's a wonderful lady, and I'm glad she's here with me this morning. And I am glad that you all are here this morning. Um, I want to bring the word to you today, um, and I want to do it as um, quickly as possible and try to um, get you along your way. I do have um, some points that I want to make this morning. I feel like I can breathe a little bit easier because this morning uh, during first service, it was like speed preaching. Now I know what that's like. So um, since everybody talks about that, if you will open up your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 16, that's where we're going to be going this morning. Um, I'm going to read two verses of scripture for you. Um, and then uh, we're going to dive right in um, to what the Lord has for us today. Starting in verse 13, it says, Therefore, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord who had spoken to her. She said, You are the God who sees me. She also said, Have I truly seen the one who sees me? So that well was named Bear. Lehe Rohi, which means well of the living one who sees me. It can still be found between Kadesh and Bered. God, we love you. We thank you for our moms. We thank you, Lord, for your word to us today, Lord. I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us. Lord, I pray that I would only speak what you would have me to speak and nothing else, Lord God. Lord, we thank you and we bless your holy name. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said amen. Oh, my goodness. I'm a little nervous, shaking a little bit. Um... I guess it might be a, might be a good thing, but um, today I want to talk to you about this woman in our text, this woman named Hagar. 
And she's not by any means the most glamorous person in the Bible. Um, so there's very, actually very little of scripture that's actually written about her. There's this chapter here. There's a further chapter down in Genesis, which I'll talk about later. And then there is a few um, lines in the New Testament. Uh, that refer to her. Um, so she's not of somebody who's glamorous. She doesn't have chapters and chapters written about her. But I do believe that there is some really great things that we're going to learn from her today. Um, she's not of significant birthright. She doesn't have any kind of pedigree per se. She's a slave, in fact. She's the maid servant of Sarai, um, who was married to Abram. Um, and she basically is a woman who does not belong to herself. She has, she has nothing of her own. She's a slave in these people's home. Um, there's actually several scholars that talk about where she actually came from and how she actually came to be um, with Abram and Sarai. And uh, one of the one of it was one of them was that she was the daughter of Pharaoh, and that when Abram and Sarai went down to um, Egypt and had their little um, tiff down there, that she actually was a gift from Pharaoh to um, Abram and Sarai. There's also other talk about the fact that she was actually bought by Abram and Sarai just as a slave there while she's in Egypt. But um, this woman is of Egyptian blood. She is not of um, the house of Israel or the house of Abram. She's a foreigner. She's in a foreign place. She's not one, um, that she's not in her own country anymore. So she's, she's all by herself. She doesn't have anyone. And some other things that are significant, I guess, about this woman is that she's very mistreated. Um, she's very used in this relationship with Abraham, Abram and Sarai. And she is, um, we're going to talk about that a little bit um, today, about how mistreated she is. Um, she's actually been given up multiple times or given away multiple times. She's given away first into slavery, and then she's given away um, from Sarai to Abram to kind of um, bring about this promise that they have um, been given. God gave them a promise about 10 years before our scripture that we have here this morning. And um, 10 years before they were given this promise that they were going to be um, the father and mother of many nations and the promise never comes. And so Sarai decides, well, I'm just going to take matters into my own hands. Have you ever been there before where you're just going to take matters into your own hands? And so she, uh, Sarai takes her maidservant, which is, it, it's actually a very common practice back there in Bible times for them to do this. If you couldn't have children because that was your primary um, responsibility, um, was to have children and to carry on the line, um, they, would, they would use concubines and they would use maidservants to kind of fulfill this. So it's not an uncommon practice, but she's given away and she's not able to make this decision for herself. She's not able, nobody's asked her, is it okay for you to do this? Nobody's asked um, Hagar if it's okay for her to go into Abram. She's just told, this is what you're going to go do. And so she's caught up in this drama with Abram and Sarai, and she's, she has, and she's not even supposed to be involved in it. She's not supposed to be involved in this promise at all. But God saw this, and he revealed himself to her amid all this turmoil and this distress and caused promise to be extended unto her into her life. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. That was just kind of a quick backstory. Um, and there's several things that I want us to, to look at and, and glean from this morning. First of all, I want to talk to you about Hagar, the person that is emotionally abandoned. Okay? She, I told you before, she's never had anyone who's been on her side. She was sold to Abram and Sarah. She's ensla enslaved in Egypt. She's in this conflict that arises between after she has, after she becomes pregnant and actually has the child, Ishmael, Sarai is kind of upset with her. Sarai has made this own, made this thing happen, right? She's caused this to happen. She's done this. And then she gets mad because that's what happened, um, which I think is kind of funny a little bit if you think about it. It's... Um, it's kind of the, one of those plots that you hear only on, only on TV movies or something like that. And to add insult to injury for this situation, 
her masters never really talk about her as though she were a person. They always try to talk about her in a third party kind of thing. If you read the scripture previous to the, the text that I read you this morning, it talks about their discourse, Sarai and Abram's discourse about Hagar, but they never actually say her name. They just say her that servant girl or that maid servant, and that's going to be important later on when we talk about this. Um, I told you Hagar is different from everybody else, and Sarah really looks down on her after she caught after she did this. She caused this problem to happen, and she caused um, this situation to take place. And then Sarah begins to look down on her, and so she feels kind of cast aside after the child is actually born. If you go later on into Genesis, Genesis chapter 21, um, after the child is born and Ishmael is about 14 years old, that's when actually. Um, Sarai comes and she has the she has Isaac and she gets so upset with Hagar and what she's kind of taken into her own hands she gets so mis upset with Hagar that she tells Abram she says you get rid of her you take care of this problem I can't deal with it anymore and so Abram kind of gives her some food and tells her to take the child and she runs out into the desert again but God meets her there as well and so she is emotionally and physically abandoned in this particular case. She is left to her own devices, and she has nothing left. But I'm here to tell you that God sees her. That's what I want to talk about this morning. God sees her, and he sees you. Maybe you don't have the greatest pedigree. Maybe you don't come from a, you know, a, whatever family you come from. Maybe you don't, maybe you're the black sheep of the family, or maybe you don't come, have the cleanest record up until this point. Maybe because of no fault of your own, you actually are involved in something, or you found yourself in something that's turmoil in your life. And, or maybe it's because of something you've done. Maybe it's because of something you participated in. Hagar participated in this. And you just really don't have any control over your situation. Or maybe like, maybe this morning I'm talking to you and you don't feel like you fit in. Hagar didn't fit in with this, with this family, with this group. Maybe you've tried running away from your past and it just keeps catching up with you. And then, um... And you're running, you're running, you're running. And if these are these things, then maybe you have something in common with Hagar this morning. Because she is found in this place of emotional abandonment. She's found in this place. And that's the place that, that God finds her. And the other thing I want to talk to you about um, is also the fact that not only is she emotionally abandoned, but she has got an attitude. She has got a chip on her shoulder. Verse 4, if you look back in our, in our text from Genesis 16, verse 4 says, tells us that Hagar despised her mistress. And some, some versions say the word contempt. And I think it's very interesting that Hagar started treating her mistress the way that she had been treated. Sarai and Abram looked down on Hagar because she was a slave and she was a means to an end. But then... We flip the script, and Hagar gets pregnant, or she conceives this child, and she decides, well, I'm better than Sarai. I'm better. I start, she starts seeing her life as something better. All of a sudden, she's... Um, something that her, she did something that her mistress could not, she could not, Sarai could not conceive a child. And so now she has conceived this child, Hagar's pregnant. And she thinks, you know what? My station in life is going to change because now I'm not going to be a slave. I'm going to be Abram's wife. And so she starts looking down her nose. Have you ever known somebody that looked down their nose at you, kind of, or that got an attitude with you? If you're a mom, I know you can relate to, to a child that has um, gotten an attitude with you, and they roll their eyes, and they snake their neck. Okay, so, and you want to just smack them in the head. You can't do that, but anyways. Um, so... She th Hagar is over here with this attitude towards Sarai, and she's, she's kind of um, 
got her back up. You know, she's, she's, she, she thinks she's better. And so she's looking down on the situation. You know what? We often think that we are right in giving someone else an attitude. Because after all, they've not shown me respect, so why should I show them respect? Now, was, was Hagar justified in her feelings? Yeah, probably because she was mistreated, right? She was used, she was put away. She, she probably could say that I, I'm justified in, in feeling this way towards them. But just because of that did not give her the right to have an attitude with them. We can be 100% justified in our feelings. I don't think there's any wrong feelings or right feelings and completely on the side of right in whatever situation we find ourselves in. But if our attitude, folks, does not line up with the word of God, this will get us in trouble every time. It's gotten me in trouble more than once. All right. Romans 12, 14 says this. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Abram and Sarah persecuted her. They were mean to her. But the word of God is here telling us we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to curse them. We are supposed to bless them. I know that's hard. I know it's hard to bless somebody who has done you wrong, right? Jesus says, it's this, says it this way in Luke 6, 28. He says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who, who abuse you. We have to pray for them. Now, sometimes that's a little harder than than meets the eye, right? Sometimes I know in my own life, maybe not you, but in my own life, when somebody when I felt wronged or I felt like I was in the right and I felt like I was wrong, sometimes I have to get down and pray and it might take me 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour before I can actually pray for that person. But I get there eventually. So we have to pray for those who abuse us. Hagar had difficulty keeping her emotions in check. How many of you have ever had a problem with keeping your emotions in check? (laughs) Amen. I'm right there with you. I've been there before because I thought that, you know, I thought I was right or I thought the person should have been um, better to me or the circumstance should have been better to me and I've let that overtake me and I've had to check myself, right? Right? I heard somebody say, check yourself before you wreck yourself. Um, and, and copping an attitude will wreck us every time. Um, so I've given you two negatives, right? I've given you the, the fact that she was emotionally abandoned, and I've given you the fact that she has an attitude. Now I want to talk about Hagar as the positive person, <laughs> okay? She comes around. She comes around to what she needs to do. Um, and, and my third point for this morning is Hagar is obedient. Say that again. Hagar is obedient, right? Hagar had to return. Here she is in our, in our text. She is in the desert. She has run away because Sarai has mistreated her. She's run away, and she is sitting in the desert. And God comes to her in a very special form. If you look at verse 9, it says, Then the angel of the Lord told her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. That's a word we do not like. That word submit. But we have to. This special form um, that God takes on, and when you see the angel of the Lord in Scripture, particularly in the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament, sorry, and there's a capital L there. It's what they call a theophany, which just is a big word for he's the pre-incarnate Jesus. So Jesus came to her in the desert and stood in front of her and talked to her. And he said, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And we know that Hagar was obedient because she left that place and she went back to Sarai and Abram. She, she took everything that she had, all her crying, weeping, and mistreatment, and went back to the place of mistreatment because God told her to do so. 
Sometimes our obedience is what God tells us to do, and it's not pretty. It's not a rose garden. It's not um, happiness and um, rainbows and unicorns and things like that, right? It's not those things, but when we walk in obedience, God is honored by that. We see Hagar, even when she goes back to the situation, she's continually being mistreated. And eventually, I told you that Abram casts her out. He, he gets rid of her. He, he's like, go, go away, take your son, take this food. And she, in Genesis 21, it talks about how she stands before, she stands in the desert, she thinks she's going to die, but God comes to her again. And I think it's because she was obedient in the first place. She was obedient to the taskmaster that was mistreating her. She was obedient to the person that um, should have been there for her, but she, and he was not. But she was obedient in what God had told her to do. Go back to your mistress and submit yourself to her. Even in this, God is faithful to her and brings about a promise in her life because Ishmael is there with her. She thinks that Ishmael is going to die because they have no water, they have no food, they're in the desert. And Ishmael, God tells her in Genesis 21, he's going to be a great nation. I'm going to bless him through you, uh, through your faithfulness to me. She's not going to die. You're not going to die here. You're going to continue on. And he, she talk, uh, he talks to her about all the things that Ishmael is going to be. I believe that it's because of her obedience to God and she was willing to go through the difficulty or the difficult thing because it was the right thing to do. And God honored that obedience. If we'll walk in obedience to him, he will honor that. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually he'll honor that. Psalms 128.1 says this, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. John says it this way, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and will come to him, and make our home with him. Do you want the Lord to make your home, his home with you? Then we have to walk in obedience. We have to walk in obedience to Christ. We have to. Proverbs 10, 17 says, He, he who keeps in, instruction is in the way of life. But he who refuses correction goes astray. And 1 John, I, lo I love this part. 1 John 2, 17 says, And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. This is but temporary, right? This is but temporary. Our real home is in heaven. Obedience is not always fun. And it's not always popular. <laughs> And it's certainly not the, all, the easiest way to go, but it is the way that leads to life. I told you before, I don't think Hagar would have fared as well as she did with Ishmael and, and, and the product of that if she hadn't um, gone back, like you said. We have got to be obedient to what the Word of God says. Mothers and fathers, we want our children to be obedient to us, right? We have got to be obedient to Christ in all things. And, and I'm not going to take the time to read it this morning, but Titus chapter 2, if you get a chance, go back and read that whole chapter because that really talks about where our obedience lies and our obedience lies to Christ and how wives need to submit to their husbands and, and, and all of those things. And there's multiple layers to this obedience thing that God wants us to follow through with. The last thing I want to talk to you about this morning is... This idea of Hagar seeing God and is seen by God. I remember um, long before we came to uh, pastor here at um, Healing Waters, um, my husband and I, we lived in a one-bedroom apartment in Grafton, and we were newly married, and um, God was calling him to go out and evangelize full-time and he was 
he was then a, a general manager at McDonald's. And he was making you know, pretty good money, and I was working too. And I can't remember if I was pregnant or not. But um, at that point in my life, when he was, when she was saying that, or when he, God was saying those things to William, I was scared. I was very concerned about what our life was going to look like. And um, I didn't. I don't think I had as much faith then as I do now. But anyways, um, and I remember uh, we were in the West Point Church of God, Canaan Church of God, I think is what it's called now. And we were there, and he was holding a series of meetings there, evangelizing there. And I thought, man, we don't have anything booked out past these two weeks. And I thought, goodness gracious, I'm, we're, we're, we're going to be in trouble if, he, if, he really want, if God really wants him to do this, you know. And I remember, I, I, I've never really had, like, visions or dreams or anything like that. But um, this one in particular time, the Lord showed me this picture, I, look, I think in pictures. So he showed me this picture, and it was like he was looking down, and I was watching, and I could see myself sitting in our little bedroom, sitting on our bed in, in our little one-bedroom apartment, and I remember God speaking to me during that meeting, I see you. I see you. I see where you're at. I see what you're going through. I know you're scared, but I've got this. I, I can see you. And I don't, the peace of God that came over me that night was like, okay, you can do what, do what you have, do what you need to do. Um because I understood that God could see me. And that is so important in this, in this passage, how God came to see Hagar. And she calls him El Roe, the God who sees me. And it's just part of the story that's so interesting because God is, is giving himself or revealing his name and, and, and she... All through the scriptures, God, God kind of talks to people, and he, he kind of reveals his name to, uh, to people. But in this particular time, or there's only a few times actually in scripture that a person actually gives a name to God. And in this particular case, she uses this name, El Roe, the God who sees me. I think it's interesting that when Hagar removed herself physically from those who controlled every aspect of her life, a personal identity and relationship materializes not with the person that she was intimate with, not with Abram, but with God himself. And that's what he wants to do in her life. He says, God appeared to Hagar amid all of this, and there's two things that I want you to look at. Verse 7 says, where have you come from and where are you going? The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert, and it was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Their entire interaction, this entire interaction between God and Hagar in, this, in the desert next to a well this whole time, nobody has called her by name at all, but he uses her name. He says, Hagar, first. He doesn't use her station in life. He doesn't call. He, he uses that later, but he, he, he calls her Hagar first. There is something about our names that is powerful. When you use an, somebody's name when you're talking to them, that is powerful when, you talk, when, you, when you're speaking to them. I, um, I, I like family names, when you, and, and you can name your children whatever you want. That's, that's not up to you, but I like family names. Mason is actually named after, after Pastor William Mason McCarty Jr., but he's farther back, he's named after... Uh, William's grandfather, his paternal grandfather. I think names are important. Family names are important. Elizabeth, we knew she was going to be, well, 
that's another story for another day. But she, we knew she was going to be Elizabeth Lynn. She's named after William's mom is Elizabeth Ann, and she's named after my mom, Lynn. Lynn is my mom's middle name. And so I think names are so powerful. They're so important. When we were thinking of the name for our, our son that, pa- that died, Nate, his name was going to be Joseph Nathaniel. And Joseph is William's grandfather's name. And Nathaniel is actually my nephew's first name, Bryce. He's Nathaniel Bryce Bodkin. And so names are important to, names are important to God and names are important to us when we call out our name. So she, he, he says, Hagar. And then he tells her, slave of Sarai. And I think he's trying to remind her, this is where you belong for right now. This is where you need to be for right now. And God asked two questions of Sarah or Hagar during this discourse. And these two questions, it's not because God doesn't know the answer, right? When he asks us a question, he already knows what the answer is going to be. But he's asking Hagar these questions. Where have you come from and where are you going? Because he wants to be able to create this relationship with her. He's asking about her suffering, right? He's, he's talking to her about where have you come from? Well, I've come from this place. I've come from this place. I've come from being mistreated. I've, become, I've come from being used. I've, I've been a slave. And he cares about where she's been and, what she's, and where she's going in her life. And that's why he asked these two questions. Just because this whole mistake was not something God planned does not mean that he cannot use it for his glory. I strongly believe that there are times in our lives where God is asking us those same questions. He's saying, where have you come from and where are you going? God's just not concerned about where you're going. He's concerned about where you have been. Psalms 121.8 says this, the Lord will keep you going, or you're going out and you're coming in from this time forth and forevermore. He's concerned about your coming out and your going in. Your story is important. Hagar's story was important and your story is just as important. Reflecting on our story helps us learn things about ourselves and about others. It, it, it helps us think about the things that we've done before and the mistakes that we've made so that we don't make them again going forward. It helps us reflect. God is trying to get Hagar to reflect on these things. Knowing where we've been also ensures that we won't go back to that place anymore. It's not okay. It's okay to reflect on your story, but it's not okay to get stuck there. If Hagar had been stuck there, she'd have sat in the desert and she'd have died. She'd have never gone back to Abram and Sarai, and she'd have never had Ishmael. It would have cost her her life if she got stuck in her story. I don't want you to get stuck in your story. If she'd have got stuck, she'd have thought about all the things that she was emotionally abandoned from. We don't need to get stuck there. We need to move forward. God doesn't want us to live in this place of emotional abandonment. He wants, he wants to take a moment and for us to understand who we are, where we come from, where we're going, but not because of us. Not because of, because I'm Amanda McCarty and that's great, you know, or because I'm whoever. He doesn't want us to get stuck there. He doesn't want us to think about that, but not because of us, but because of who, who we have coming behind us, right? Our children who are following us mothers. He wants us to be, I know our videos today talked about women of faith and, and, and women that can, um, that pray for people and, and pray for our kids and, and be spiritual moms. And, and that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to reflect so that we can think about what's ahead. You see, we were lost, but now we are found. We were dead to sin, but now we are alive in Christ. We are but pilgrims in this world. Our home is not here. 
Where's our home? Our home is with him, in heaven with him. Amen. Psalms 121, 1 through 2 and 7 says, I lift up my eyes to the hills, for where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. He wants us to live not in emotional abandonment. He wants us to live in this idea, this thought process, this place of perpetual adoption. Understanding that all of this is just temporary and heaven is our real home. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6 says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. There's another scripture that talks about adoption in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. I'm not going to read that this morning. You can go back and read it for yourself. Galatians chapter 4, uh, Paul writes about uh, this adoption that we have. Verses 3 through 5, we ha we've been adopted as sons and daughters. And it is this word adoption in the Greek. I'm going to try to say this. It, I mess it up, but it's huothesia, which means the nature and condition of true disciples of Christ who by receiving the spirit of God into their souls become the sons of God or daughters of God, if you want to use that. All right. We have been adopted as sons and daughters of the one true king. We are no longer abandoned. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited that I'm no longer abandoned, that I, when I was lost in my sin, Jesus found me. God has given us purpose in our life because we've received the spirit of God. This happens when we accept Jesus as our Savior. Our purpose then becomes to submit ourselves under his authority and disciple others to do the same. That's what we're called to do. We're called to submit and be obedient and, 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 and cause others to do the same, disciple others to do the same. We sing a song sometimes in church, and it's one of my favorites, actually. Um, and it, I know it says, good, good father, and we're, we're not celebrating fathers quite yet. We're celebrating mothers today. But this song talks about this adoption that we have in Christ. In the chorus, it says, you are a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. God saw Hagar in the place that she was in and circumstances that she was in and he formed this relationship with her and he no longer as saw herself as a slave but as a person on a path to freedom god has done the same for you and for me and we should be excited and overjoyed over this over this um, ransom that he's paid for us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If he never did another thing in this world, he died for me and he died for you and he adopts you into the family of God. I, I said all this to say these last few things. You are seen by God today. I don't know where you are at. I don't know what you brought in with you when you came into this building this morning. Even though we were slaves to our old ways, to our sinful ways, God saw us and he sent his son and he sent his son for you. God sees you in whatever state you find yourself in this morning. Maybe you're that one whom the people in your life have emotionally abandoned, and you need to see El Rohi, the God who sees, 
to mend those emotional scars. Maybe you're going through some difficulties because of obedience or even because we lack obedience. Maybe you're going through something and you need El Rohi to turn his gaze towards you and see you where you are this morning. Maybe you've been perplexed by all of life and life circumstances and we have been through a lot of stuff over the last little bit. I don't know about you, but I, we've been through a lot of stuff. And you need the God who sees El Rohi to see you in your perplexity and give you direction. What did he tell Hagar? Go back, go back to that house and submit yourself. He gave her direction, he gave her life direction. Maybe you've strayed from the path and you're running away and you need to turn your gaze towards El Rohi this morning and see him for the first time or the next time. Will you stand with me? I'm here to tell you today that the God of Hagar is still the God of today and he sees you. You thought you came to church today to be with mom or to meet God. And we have, we've met God, but he also came here today to meet with you. He came to that desert place to meet with Hagar and he comes to meet with you today. But he doesn't want to just see you today. He wants to see you every day. <laughs> he wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to know that he's near and that he's always there. And that he loves you so very much with an everlasting love. Let's pray. Can we pray together this morning and ask the Lord to see us? God, we love you. We thank you for who you are, God. You are El Rohi, the God who sees, and you see all things, and you know all things, and we are nothing without you. Thank you, Lord, for adopting us into your family. Thank you, Lord, for, for seeing us first and coming to us first and bringing us to you. Lord, I pray for the people in this building. I pray that, Lord, that they would find you when they, when they, when, and you would turn your gaze towards them and they would find you and they would know that you are there and that you are working in their life. Even when we don't see you, Lord, you're always working. You're always working. Help us to honor you with our obedience, Lord, and honor you with a better attitude towards our children and our, pa our parents and, our, and our, our relationships, Lord, our husbands and our wives. Lord, help us to be in that place of obedience and a better attitude, God. Help us to focus on you, the God who sees. We honor you today. We bless your name. Amen and amen. Thank you for giving me your listening ear this morning. And I pray that the Lord would continually remind you of this, that he is El Rohi, the God who sees. One of the interesting things on that narrative, have you ever compared what you got with so, what somebody else has? Just wave at me just real quick. You've done that. You say, well, I've got this and they got that. Well, why'd they get this and I didn't get that? right? One of the most powerful realizations in this entire narrative is that Hagar and Sarah both had equal promises brought about in different ways. Read the narrative. Read the text. The next time you get ready to compare what you see based with what somebody else went through or how you felt God delivered you or didn't deliver you based on what he did for somebody else. Remember that God always sees. He's always there with you. And he's moving pieces when you don't even know he's moving them. And he's doing things in your life and before you. Uh, just trust him. It's okay. It's okay. Moms, ladies, we love you so very much. Please know that your life Old, young, I'm learning this now that I'm getting <laughs> a little bit older in life. I know what some of you are thinking. He did a baby. I know. I understand. My 45 is different from, it's okay. So I understand. He did the baby. 
But here's what I'm learning. Ladies, young, old, however you define that spectrum, your life is invaluable. Your influence reaches further than your wisdom could ever know. Please make wise use of every moment because God uses your life even in moments that you didn't even know he was whispering through the very circumstances that you were walking through, even the frustrating ones. Thank you, honey, for the word of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. I want to remind you, there is a really cool, and I've already had several of you tell me about it, and I saw it for myself. There's a really cool picture wall. I don't know what else to call it. What do you call those things when you go stand in front of the, what is it? Aha. Ha, 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 ha. It's a backdrop. Thank you, daughter of mine. It is a, I can hear her thoughts. This is, let me tell you my daughter's thing. She's like, it's a backdrop, dummy. I don't even have to look at her facial expressions. But hey, there's a backdrop back there. Take some pictures. Enjoy yourself, fellowship. And ladies, if you didn't get a chance to stop by and get a gift, a card, and some of the goodies back there, please make sure you do it. We thank God for you. We're looking forward to our continued journey. Stay connected in the kingdom of God. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for our fellowship. Thank you that we can turn our eyes to you. You are always watching us but we are not always watching you. And help us with the reality that what we face and what's going on in our life never, ever changes the promises that you give us. And you give them directly. You give us individual promises of how you'll shape our life and what you'll do in our lives. But you also give us corporate promises where the life of individuals come together to make up the gift of the body in locations all across this world. So help us with the gift that you've given to our lives individually in promises and with the body. We pray your blessings on our ladies today. From the eldest to the youngest, use their life to nurture, to love, because in them truly is the reflection of our Heavenly Father. Go with your people today. Bless them, watch over them, and protect them, and continue to use us for your glory as we promise to always give you the credit for it all in Jesus name and all God's people said amen. amen take time to greet somebody and again go take a look at the backdrop God bless you we'll see you soon <laughs> I've been adopted I've taken on your name and I need Change.